Hi guys, um, welcome back to my channel. So today um, I have my baby in my arms. She will not be put down. <laughs> she wants to be held. So if you hear any like little noises, that's baby Emerson. Um, yeah, but today um, I wanted to film my labor and delivery story. Um, I feel like it's been about a month since I gave birth. Today is, let's see, January 20th. So I gave birth, or I'm sorry, it's February 20th. So it's been about a month since I've given birth and I really want to get back into my YouTube channel, but I feel like I can't really come back without filming this video first. Um, yeah, this is going to be a hard one. <laughs> it's probably going to be a really long video. I'm sure, obviously, you can already tell now, like, how long it is, but it's probably going to be pretty long. Um, and yeah, I've been avoiding making this video for a few reasons. Um, the first one being that I've just really been struggling with recovery this time around, and there's been so much going on, um, which I'll get into, but also it's just been really emotional for me. Um, and I didn't really know, I don't know, I knew if I made this video before I would just be crying and be a mess, which I probably still will probably cry at some point and get emotional. Um, so I'm sorry in advance, but yeah, I just really needed some time to process things and yeah, I don't know, I guess heal emotionally a little bit. Um, so yeah. Just a trigger warning, I'm going to be talking about um, my VBAC and I'm going to be talking about uterine rupture and I don't know, this isn't like a super positive, cheery, happy-go-lucky, easy labor and delivery story, so I just kind of wanted to let you guys know that if you're triggered by like a traumatic birth story or uterine rupture or things like that, then maybe... This isn't the video for you to watch. Um, unfortunately, it's just not as happy of a story as I was hoping. But all that aside, let's get started. So I kind of wrote down like a timeline of how this all went down, like what time everything happened. Um, so if I, you see me looking down, I'm going to be checking my phone. So I'm going to start with just like obviously the labor story and how that all started. So I went in, actually, let me back up. So my due date was January 18th. Okay, so January, on January 14th, which was a Tuesday, I started having contractions. Um, I wasn't really thinking much about it. I was bouncing on my yoga ball, just kind of like trying to see if it would get things going. At this point, I was already three centimeters dilated and I had been three centimeters dilated for I think at least two weeks at this point. Um, so I was just kind of ready. I was 39 weeks and I was really over being pregnant. And once I, it probably was like an hour, um, I started getting them a little bit stronger. And at this point I was getting a little concerned. I started timing them and they were about five to seven minutes apart. They weren't super consistent, but they were coming pretty, pretty strong. Sometimes they were only like three minutes apart. Um, so I started kind of panicking and at this point I thought Nate was going to be home within like the next 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so I waited about 30 minutes and I called Nate and I was like, hey, are you almost home? And he said he was still at work. And at this point I started panicking because I was home alone with Bowden and I was just scared that if something were to happen um, that we don't really have like family close by or anything. So I was really scared of being home alone with Bowden and like... I don't know. I don't know why, but I guess I was just, I don't know. I panicked. So I told Nate to come home. So he came home and, um, he was like, you need to call the hospital and see like if we should come in or not. So I called the hospital and they were like, well, you know, without seeing you, it's pretty hard to tell if you should come in or not. But since you're attempting a VBAC, um, you should come in so that we can check you and just kind of see what's going on. So his parents get there, we go to the hospital and they check me, I'm still a three, and she was like, all right, let's get you up and walking, let's do some laps around the hallway and see if maybe um, that will get your contractions closer together or stronger. Um, so we start doing laps around the hallway and I think it was about two hours later she checked me again and I was still a three. 
so basically they um on the monitor like on the you know how they hook you up i was having contractions about every five minutes apart but i was not like they i guess they weren't strong enough to be um dilating me so sent me home and basically they told me that if i keep having contraption contractions four to five minutes apart but i can't walk or talk through them then to come back and um that was a little bit frustrating because I don't know, like attempting a VBAC, the reason I felt comfortable attempting it is because I was going to be closely monitored and my contractions were already four to five minutes apart. So I guess I had assumed like I was doing everything correctly, everything that they were telling me to do. Um, but it wasn't enough. So I was really scared that I was going to go home and if they got bad enough to where I couldn't walk or talk through them that we wouldn't be back in time because we live about half an hour from the hospital. And on top of that, we needed to wait until one of our parents got to our house to, to watch Bowdoin, and they're about 45 minutes away. So that's about, you know, a little under an hour and a half um, from when we call somebody to when we can get to the hospital. So I was a little nervous about it, but we went home anyway. So I had a doctor's appointment again that Thursday, I believe, which was, what, the 16th? Um, and I was checked again. I was still a three, still having contractions. They did a non-stress test and they said that it looked great. Baby looked great and everything was fine. Um, so my OB gave me the option then to be induced at 40 weeks on my due date, which is Saturday, or we could wait another week and see if anything, you know, if I went into labor on my own. We just decided to go in on Saturday and get induced. So we were supposed to be there at 7 a.m., and of course, um, Illinois, where I live, we had a terrible um, snowstorm Friday night. So it was snowing all Friday night, and then it started raining. And then by Saturday morning, um, it all froze over. So the roads were like complete, completely covered in ice and horrible. So we uh, actually almost rescheduled our induction, but we decided to still go and just drive like really, really slowly. So we didn't get there till 7:30. Um, so by the time I got like my blood pressure checked and hooked up my IV in and everything, um, it was about 8.30 when they started the Pitocin. So, so yeah, at 8.30 I was three centimeters still and they started the Pitocin. By 9.30 I was four centimeters dilated and the OB came in and went ahead and broke my water. So by about 11.30 my contractions were getting pretty strong. Um, and I decided to go ahead and call for the epidural. They weren't like terrible where I couldn't, like they were getting pretty painful, like I couldn't really talk through them. Um, but it's not like I was dying for the epidural, but I knew I was going to be getting the epidural at some point. I really wanted the epidural, so I was like, you know what, I might as well just get it now. I know it takes a while for the anesthesiologist to actually like come in. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and call for it. And at 12.30, the anesthesiologist came and did my epidural. This time, everyone had to leave the room, which really sucked last time. Nate was able to stay with me, but that's okay. This time, no one was allowed in the room, so I was there alone with the nurse and the anesthesiologist. I went ahead and told them that last time with my first birth, the epidural only worked on one side. Um, so I don't know, like I didn't know if that was the anesthesiologist's fault or something is like weird with my spine or my back or something. So everything worked great. Um, I wasn't feeling any contractions anymore. And then after about an hour, um, I started to feel contractions. Which side was it? On my left side. So my right side was completely numb, but my left side I was still feeling contractions, which was the exact opposite of how it happened last time. So basically it confirmed to me that something is like messed up in my back. I have some sort of like disc or something is off. Maybe it's like slightly curved. Uh, so by 1.30, they came back to check me and I was six centimeters dilated. They called back for the anesthesiologist to come back and try and see if we can fix my epidural at this point. So at 2 p.m., the anesthesiologist came back in and they gave me another like boost, I guess, of the medicine that goes through your epidural port in your back. And they had me lay on my side, which is what they had me do the first time as well. Um, so they laid me on my left side to see if maybe gravity would help push everything down. So that worked, and after about a half an hour, I was feeling fine. I started feeling extremely numb on my right side, like I could not feel literally anything. I could not feel my toes, nothing. It was super, super numb. Um, and then my left side, 
I could still feel the contractions like kind of mildly but it took like the edge off I could barely feel anything so that was a little bit concerning because I was worried that when it came time to push that I wouldn't be able to feel on my right side but regardless I ended up working and they did not have to redo my epidural this time which I'm so so grateful for so at 4.40, about three hours later, they checked me again, and I was still at a 6, um, which I was very surprised because, honestly, I had been progressing pretty quickly. I mean, not super quickly, but, you know, like, on an average, I was progressing. Let's see, so at 8.30, I was a 4, and by 1.30, I was a 6. So you would think three hours later that I would have been further along. So she went ahead, the nurse, um, gave me the peanut ball. And then at 5.45, so about an hour later, I was still a 6. So she had me flip to the opposite side with the peanut ball. And then at 6.30, so about, I don't know, 45 minutes later, she checked me again. I started to have some pressure, and I was at a 10. So it's pretty crazy that from, let's see, from 1.30 to 5.45, I was stuck at a 6. And then literally within, like, 45 minutes, I jumped to a 10. So about 6.30... Um, is when we started to push. Now this is when things kind of get crazy. <laughs> so honestly, like my whole labor was very, very chill. I really didn't feel much pain. Like I said, I had some pain at the beginning before my epidural, but where I like started not being able to talk through the contractions. But all in all, I like, compared to my first labor, this was a breeze and I was like so grateful and I'm like, great, this is gonna be great. Like I'm gonna push a few times, baby's gonna come out and it's gonna be great. <laughs> um, but that was not the case. So again, we started pushing, I did some practice pushes and I had a really hard time because I could not feel my contractions at all, especially on my right side because it was so numb. I could not even lift my leg up into the stirrup. The nurse had to lift it for me um, so they decided to turn off my epidural so that I could start to feel like feel the contractions and also feel where I was pushing because I was having a really hard time even telling if I was pushing correctly because I was so numb so they turned it off and I started feeling <laughs> I definitely started feeling it pretty quickly so during this time when I was pushing um, there started to there started to be some blood in my catheter um i still had my catheter in from my epidural if you don't know when you do get an epidural they put a catheter in because you're obviously your legs get numb so you can't walk to the bathroom so they don't take the catheter out until you're pretty much like the baby's like right there that's my understanding at least so i still had my catheter in and there was blood in my catheter and i remember the nurse kind of like holding it up and showing the doctor my ob um but no one really seemed concerned at this point. So at some point during my pushing, I don't remember when, because obviously I was not staring at the clock, um, baby was turned. So she was having a hard time getting past my pelvic bone because her head, so babies are supposed to come out like this with their chin tucked to their um, like chest. And she was like this, like turned. So she was having a hard time passing by my pelvic bone. So they had me actually flip onto my side and start pushing on my, like while I was turned onto my side to see if she would pass my pelvic bone. Finally got her past my pelvic bone. And then, so at this point I was pushing for almost, let's see, it was about an hour and 45 minutes. Um, and things started getting really bad really fast at this point. So like I said, there was blood in my catheter. I don't remember when that happened exactly. Um, but I do remember that the nurse's shift change was at seven o'clock. Um, so like I said, I started pushing at 6.30 and that was with my first nurse. So, and she was the one who held up the blood, the catheter with the blood in it. So sometime between 6.30 and seven is when I started bleeding. Now at about eight o'clock here is when things got bad <laughs> um i was pushing and baby's heart rate started dropping like dramatically whenever i would push so they put the oxygen mask on me um every time i pushed or not every time i pushed i'm sorry they would take it off when i would push but in between they would give me the oxygen mask to try and help i guess i don't really know exactly what that does but it was because the baby's heart rate was dropping so basically <laughs> At this point, it was about 8.15 when they kind of started prepping for a C-section. Everyone got scrubs on, and I was still pushing at this point, and my OB basically told me, like, hey, I know we tried the forceps with your first birth, and that was, like, not helpful, and you didn't want to do that again, 
but we can try the vacuum, which is like the little kiwi like suction thing that they use. Um, or I think we're, we're about to call it, you know? So I was like, okay, does the vacuum hurt? Like, does it hurt the baby? Like, you know, is it like bad? Cause I know the forceps, like it hurt me a lot. <laughs> and then it also hurt Bowden. Like he had the little marks on his, the side of his head and I just really didn't want to do that again. Um, and she's like, no, no, it's totally safe. It's fine. So I was like, you know what? Fine. Let's try the vacuum because at this point I am in insane amount of pain. I was feeling literally everything. My epidural had pretty much completely worn off at this point. Um, and baby was like right there. Like I really, I just really didn't want to give up. Um, so we used the vacuum, pushed, I don't know, maybe two or three more times and baby came out and she was born at 827. Super healthy, head full of hair, screaming, crying, and you know, good as can be. Um, I tore. I had a few internal tears. I think one exterior tear. They said it's most. It was mostly um, tissue. So they went ahead and stitched me up. I didn't know. Like they didn't tell me the degree of the tear or anything. Um, and yeah, at that point I was bleeding a lot. There was a lot of blood, but I had never experienced a vaginal birth before because my first was a c-section so I didn't really know if that was normal or what like you know what was normal or what was not um yeah clean baby up put her on my chest and that was pretty much it I mean you know it was like great we did it it's all it's all awesome um there was a huge sigh of relief <laughs> when baby came out and I don't know I was just like a, a high like I was so proud of myself that I did it because the first time I could not push Bowdoin out um so yeah it was like this sense of relief that I did it and it was over and yeah I thought everything was great um so yeah basically at this point they had already removed the catheter because I pushed the baby out um and I was feeling good um so about 9 30 my sister came in to see the baby she was waiting out in the hallway the whole time she got to meet the baby and at that point we started having visitors and my dad came he showed up right around 11 so at this point obviously the cafeteria is closed i had not eaten since like 7 a.m and i all i had that morning was like two pieces of toast so i was starving so my dad stopped and got us mcdonald's because that was the only thing that was open <laughs> i really wanted like chipotle or something really good but nothing else was open so he got us McDonald's and um, I ate I had some chicken nuggets and I had a chocolate shake which now looking back I regret that I literally chugged that chocolate shake so fast and about 20 minutes later I started not feeling like the best like my stomach started kind of feeling upset and I thought it was probably just because I chugged a chocolate shake like an idiot like dairy does not really do well with my stomach in general but especially like right after birth what was I thinking so I thought it was just that so about 11 30 came around and um they wanted to have us switch rooms like from the labor and delivery side to the mom and baby side so they in order for you to switch rooms they have to get you up and walk to the bathroom and you have to urinate <laughs> before you can leave because obviously you don't have a catheter. So they went to stand me up and I immediately felt really lightheaded and like not good. Um, so I sat back down right away. My blood pressure like immediately tanked and she's like, okay, that's all right. Like that just means, you know, you're not ready. Like that's okay. Not a big deal. We'll try in a little bit. So then Nate's brother and um, his brother's girlfriend came in and they were visiting with us for a little bit and I started having this really bad pain in my right side and my abdomen and it was like shooting down my whole right leg. <sighs> so I started to feel sick <laughs> and I immediately was like, Nate, please, I need like a bucket or something. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I need a bag or a bucket like right now. Like I'm going to throw up right now. Please find something. So he found a barf bag and I immediately threw up everything that I had eaten. And let me tell you, chocolate shake coming back up is one of the most repulsive things <laughs> ever it's so disgusting having throw up come up your throat that tastes like chocolate shake I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy so threw up that was great um and then 
I was still having that pain. So I called the nurse back and she was like, okay, let's have you try and pee, <laughs> like urinate in basically a bedpan um, because you can't get up. And I could not, I could not go. Now looking back, I understand why, but um, it was pretty concerning at that point because it was about, let's see, three hours since I had given birth and I still was not able to use the bathroom. Um, and the pain was just getting stronger and stronger. The only way I can explain this pain to you is it was like a contraction. Obviously contractions go up and they go down and that tip of the contraction is so painful, right? Where you like cannot breathe. That's how it felt, but it never released. It was just that pain, that tight pain, that pressure constantly in my right side and all the way down my right leg where it would like build and build and build and build and build and I thought like my leg was going to explode like it hurt so bad and it was not letting up so they decided to give me some pain meds actually no I'm sorry she gave me the pain meds and then I threw up and that's why I think I threw up is because of those pain meds so then I start crying because I'm in so much pain <laughs> and they just gave me the meds that I threw up and she can't give me any other meds because I'm throwing up so I'm like, I'm just going to have to be here in pain. So she <laughs> gave me pain meds through my IV at that point. Okay, so at some point, I don't remember what point in the night here, um, they, like the pain was just getting worse and worse and worse and nothing was helping. The pain meds were not helping. So they brought the OB that was on call that night into my room and they basically told me that they thought my bladder was probably too full because I wasn't able to urinate after birth. Um, and that's what was causing this pain. At first they were trying to tell me that it was after birth contractions. No, like this was not a contraction. Okay. Um, so yeah, they thought that my bladder was too full. So they were going to insert a catheter into me, back into me, I should say, and try and empty my bladder and see if that helped. So they stick a catheter in me and mind you, I am in an insane amount of pain. The epidural has completely worn off now, like literally nothing. Um, the pain meds literally did nothing for me that they gave me through the IV. Um, so I'm like screaming in pain as they're trying to shove a catheter up in me where I literally just pushed a baby out of and I have a ton of stitches in. So you can imagine, uh, it was horrendous. Get the catheter in me and the tiniest bit of urine comes out. This is another red flag. Again, these are all these things that like looking back, hindsight is 2020, and now I understand what was happening but then I didn't, so it's just frustrating. But yeah, so barely any urine came out and they were like, huh, that's really weird. I don't know what's wrong, but work is just gonna give you a ton of pain meds through your IV and try and help you, you know, be a bit more comfortable. And we'll see what happens in the morning, basically. Another thing that really pisses me off. So they gave me a ton of pain meds and basically it just took the edge off like I could still feel the pain in my abdomen and my leg and it was super super strong but it wasn't like I didn't, it really just took like the tiniest bit of the edge off basically. So at this point we are in and out of sleep all night barely sleeping um, and yeah so this was Saturday so then Sunday they early in the morning it must have been like probably 7 a.m. 8 a.m. I don't know. Um, they come to us and they're like, hey, so we think that your bladder might have a leak in it, which sometimes that happens during birth. Um, so we are going to run a test on you. We're going to do like a dye test where we take you downstairs and they fill your bladder up with a bunch of dye and then they do like a little CT scan to see if it's flowing out of your bladder or not, basically, right? So they do this test. And at this point, um, every time I was standing up or moving really at all, but when I stood up to get into the wheelchair and when I stood up to get back into the wheelchair, a bunch of liquid would gush down my legs. And mind you, I have these huge maxi pads on from after birth. Um, so I was just gushing liquid and I was like, okay, this is not normal. So we get the results back from my dye test and my, it comes back that my bladder was ruptured and I was leaking urine and that's why I was gushing so much urine 
that was coming out of me because my bladder obviously could not hold the urine because there was a tear in it so it was just coming out um, and that's also why I could not urinate after I gave birth because my bladder was ripped open <laughs> So yeah, we see a urologist and he comes in and he's like, hey, so we're pretty sure your bladder um, is ruptured, obviously, there's a tear in it, but um, we think that your bladder will probably just heal on its own. We don't need to do anything, we don't need to do surgery or anything, but we are going to do another dye test to make sure that the urine, that the tear is in the bottom of your bladder and not the top because if you're leaking urine out of the bottom of your bladder it's just going down like through your vagina and just leaking out of you which is fine but if it's at the top of your bladder and it's leaking into your abdomen that can obviously be like a really big issue <laughs> um, it can be poisonous so we need to make sure that it's not going up so I do another dye test and that comes back and the good news is that it's at the bottom of my bladder everything is coming out and there's like no cause for concern there so we're all good. Basically we're like, okay, this sucks, but like it's going to heal on its own and we're going to be fine. So Monday rolls around and Monday morning the OB comes in and this is not my OB. This is the on-call OB, which is the third one that I saw. So the first on-call OB that I saw was the night of my birth. That's the one who put the catheter in me and everything. Now this is the second on-call OB, and then I saw my like my regular OB on Saturday or on Sunday. I'm sorry, and then on Monday there's another on-call OB. This OB actually works in the same practice as mine that I was originally seeing throughout my whole pregnancy. So she comes to us and she's like, "Hey, so I know they say that everything's fine with your bladder, but I want to call and get a second opinion. So we're gonna call downtown Chicago, um, a specialist." And we're just going to get a second opinion. I'm going to send them all of your tests, like all your dye tests, and kind of tell them what's going on and see what they think. She's like, it's probably fine. You're probably like totally okay, but I just want to confirm um, that this is all good, right? So we're like, okay, what the hell? Like, <laughs> we literally just were told that we're fine and it's going to heal on its own and it's no big deal. And now you're telling us maybe it's not. Okay, no big deal. So the specialist calls us from Chicago and basically tells us that um, my uterus probably ruptured, my bladder definitely ruptured. He basically tells me that they want me to be transferred by ambulance downtown today, <laughs> that day on Monday, um, to get a cystoscopy performed which is basically just like a test where they run a camera like up your urethra and basically they get a better look of what is exactly going on because the dye test can only tell them if there is a leak in the bladder like if there's fluid running out of it with the dye they can kind of tell but they can't tell if it's the uterus and the bladder or just the bladder or how bad the bladder tear is or really anything of substance it's just if it's leaking or not so as you can imagine it was just a roller coaster from like you're fine to your bladder's ruptured but it's not a big deal to it might be a big deal to it is a big deal and we need to send you downtown like today to get this basically done um at this point we thought we were going home it's monday like we thought we were going to be going home that day um and on top of it all <laughs> uh my daughter like the baby i just gave birth to she would not be allowed to come with me so i'd be transferred downtown by myself and on top of it it's peak flu season so nobody under the age of 18 is allowed to visit you in the hospital so we had not seen Bowden at this point yet he had not met his sister he had not seen us and now i would be transferred downtown and the baby cannot come with me because she was being released from the hospital um, and neither of them could visit us <laughs> in the hospital so like, I don't know, to give birth to your baby and 24 or 48 hours later to be told like, okay, now you have to go downtown to another hospital to have these emergency tests run and you can't be with your baby anymore. Like it's just, <sighs> it sucks. Um, so basically they decided to give us the option to go home Monday night and then Tuesday early in the morning go um, to a different hospital that they like are affiliated with 
and get this cystoscopy done. So that's what we decided to do so that we could go home for one night and be with our babies. So before we leave, another urologist comes in and he was like, hey, so yeah, you're good to go. We're going to keep the catheter in you for two weeks. And if you're still leaking urine, then you can come into my office and we'll put stints in your kidneys. And after four weeks, if you're still leaking from that point, then we might have to do surgery. And I was like, wait a second. The specialist just said that that's not the case. Like we need to go in and get the cystoscopy done. And they also told us that my uterus might be ruptured. So like, how are you going to fix the bladder if the uterus isn't ruptured or if the uterus is ruptured? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I don't deal with that. And I was like, okay, but don't you need to talk to the OB and kind of like work together because the bladder and the uterus are on top of each other? So basically he told us, no, no, you're fine to go home. And we were like, okay, whatever. We're not listening to you. Obviously we're going to go see the specialist. So Tuesday now rolls around Tuesday morning and we go see the specialist um, and the actual term is a urogynecologist, which is basically um, a like they specialize in the whole pelvic region of the female. So uterus, cervix, bladder, like everything. So basically we're in the best hands possible because they understand all of the pelvic region and not just the bladder or the uterus. So we go and see her and she does the cystoscopy, which was extremely painful. And yeah, so she gets done with the cystoscopy and she basically tells us that it's like the worst case scenario. My uterus was for sure ruptured. Bladder was for sure ruptured. And I believe she used the term a gaping hole in my bladder. So not just a little tear, it was a gaping hole. <laughs> um, so that's great. Um, and basically she said that there's three options. We can either try and keep your uterus like no matter what. Um, we can attempt to save your uterus, but if it's like not, um, what the word she say, like if it's not good for you or is it, if it's not repairable, just take it out or three, just remove the uterus. Um, she basically informed us that she might not be able to save it because I had just given birth and your uterus is so expanded after birth. And also your blood vessels are very expanded after birth, so you can have a lot of bleeding as well. So basically, I just delivered my baby, and three days later, I got the news that I needed to have emergency surgery. She said for sure that week we're going to be doing surgery, if not tomorrow, which was Tuesday, or I'm sorry, Wednesday. Um, so I went from having a baby, like walking in a healthy 27-year-old, to possibly losing my uterus and being done having babies without like not having the choice um, and having to have emergency surgery within a week so as you can imagine um, it was really emotional and it still is really emotional but it was just I don't know I don't know it's it's a lot it's a lot to take in and especially like I'm you know, a week postpartum, like my emotions, my hormones are already like all over the place. And to be told that is just horrible. And on top of it, like physically just dealing with it, like having, I don't know, at that point I had had a catheter and it was so painful. And then they removed my catheter and <laughs> basically I'm just like leaking gallons of urine all the time I'm constantly having to wear I mean like an adult diaper with multiple maxi pads and then on top of it like even when I stand up with that I'm gushing so much liquid that I'm like going through three pairs of pants a day like I'm constantly peeing my pants essentially like it's just horrible and you're bleeding after postpartum like there's it was just so much going on so we went in for surgery on Friday which was let's see the dates so I gave birth on Saturday the 18th and I went in for surgery Friday the 24th. So about six days after I gave birth. And also I forgot to mention during my appointment with the urogynecologist, she basically said that she was extremely surprised that I did not need a blood transfusion 
during my delivery um, and she said with uterus rupture of course it can be really bad for the mom because you can lose a lot of blood and it can be really scary um, but she said it's almost always fatal for the baby and she is extremely surprised that Emerson came out with no issues um, no brain damage no oh my gosh issues um, and it's hard for me to talk about that because I just feel so selfish like she her heart rate was dropping so much and it could have been really damaging to her um, and it could have killed her I don't know exactly at what point my uterus ruptured um, I'm assuming it was when I started pushing because of the blood in my catheter um, but I don't know because I was pushing for about two hours from the time I started pushing to the time Emerson was born it was about two hours um, so even if it was an hour and a half um, between my uterus rupturing and Emerson being born it just seems like that's too long like that I, I don't know I don't know why or how by some grace of God or some miracle we, I had a I had a guardian angel looking over us because I don't know how both my uterus and my bladder ruptured and we are both completely fine I mean I'm not fine like I'm having all these issues after the fact but like the fact that we survived and neither of us needed emergency medical intervention I don't know I'm forever grateful for that I'm forever grateful for that um yeah but basically she told me that my bladder would have never healed on its own um so thank god we didn't listen to that urologist and also thank god that that OB pushed us to get a second opinion from a specialist or else I'd be walking around with a blown uterus and a blown bladder and just thinking that it would heal itself I guess um also, she said that the pain that I was feeling on my right side, down my leg, um, was probably because my uterus was ruptured. And after birth, your uterus contracts to try and get it, uh, get it to like shrink back down to size, down to your normal size. And she thinks that my uterus was probably trying to contract, but since there was obviously a huge tear in it, um, it could not contract <laughs> so that's why I was having that horrible pain back to my surgery so um yeah there's not much to report on that basically they I remember being wheeled back to the OR and they knocked me out of course um so basically she said they're they were going to attempt a few things uh, a few different ways so she said that she was going to attempt it laparoscopically which means they were going to go in with you know the robotics and make a few different incisions one through my belly button and like a few in my abdomen and try and repair my uterus and my bladder that way um, she said if that didn't work which she wasn't super hopeful that it would work um, because my uterus was so enlarged and there'd be so much bleeding that it would probably be hard to see so she said if that didn't work then they were gonna go in through my c-section scar and cut me open that way and do perform the surgery that way um, she was going to try and save my uterus if she could, but she didn't seem super hopeful on that one as well because she said even if she could stitch it up, if it's so swollen, it would be hard to stitch up, but even if she could, there'd be so much blood loss that she thinks, you know, it might be too difficult to even see. I wake up from surgery and I find out that they did not do anything they ended up not repairing anything and I was very angry um, also I was waking up from like heavy medication but I was mad <laughs> um, because I felt like I had gone through so much emotionally and it was such a big emotional roller coaster and to go through all that and then wake up and then be like yeah so we didn't repair anything you're still stuck with like all these issues I was like WTF <laughs> you know um, 
so they went on to explain that basically they uh, were marking this as an exploratory surgery. So they were able to look inside of me and see what was going on. Um, my bladder is bladder had a gaping hole. It's a very, very large tear. And my uterus was basically split in two. Um, the way she said it was like this, like the tear went down the whole uterus. Um, and when I heard that, I burst into tears because basically to me, that's pretty much saying that they probably will not be able to repair it. Um, and the damage is so extensive that even if they are to repair it, that I probably will never be able to have another baby again. Um, I guess she didn't rule it out completely, but she told me that it would be an extremely high risk pregnancy and that if she was my obstetrician, she would be terrified. <laughs> um, basically, she told me that if we do want to have another baby, that the risk is just really great because of how um, bad the rupture is that you know your risk of having another baby is that that uterus has to grow um, as the baby grows and as the more it stretches the more pressure you're putting on those stitches or on on the repair um, and that can burst at any time so my risk of my uterus rupturing early you know like god forbid it ruptured at 20 weeks um the baby would definitely not make it and you know i might not make it like there could be a lot of risk to me because if i'm not being in a hospital being monitored every day let's say i'm sitting at home at 20 weeks pregnant and my uterus ruptures right now you know i would i don't know by the time i would get to a hospital it could be really bad um so yeah, again, being a 27 year old, you know, hearing that you're probably never gonna be able to have another baby. It's just like, you know, it's hard and it's not fair. And it makes me angry because nobody told me, I mean, I did a lot of research on my own too, and I never ever saw or heard or anything that if your uterus ruptures, that you will not be able to carry another baby and if i would have known that i would have opted for a repeat c-section because i was not ha done having babies um my ob knew that i was not done having babies and i just really wish i was informed of that beforehand because it just makes me mad like now my whole life is forever changed for multiple reasons um, I can have these lifelong effects, possibly. And on top of it, you know, the last month of my life and the next month or two of my life is going to be, I'm going to be having so many more physical issues. And on top of it now, I can never have another baby. And it's just not fair. Like, it's not fair when you can't make that choice for yourself, you know? So that's probably been the hardest part of this whole experience is having that being taken away from me so so anyway um, basically they decided that they could have done the bladder repair that day but um, since there was so much damage to the uterus and since my blood cells were so enlarged and I was bleeding very heavily um, she thought it would be better to wait at least six weeks so that the uterus can heal and the bladder can heal and everything can kind of go back down um, to size um, and then she thinks she has a better chance of saving my uterus and also getting a better a better um, I guess stitch or whatever I went home from the hospital on the 20th with the catheter they removed it at the office um, on that Tuesday and Friday I had surgery they put the catheter back in and I've had a catheter ever since so it's been about three weeks now 
Um, and yeah, my surgery is tentatively scheduled for March 9th. Um, so a week beforehand, I will go ahead and go in for my pre-op appointment and they will remove my catheter then. Um, so I will have a week without it, which I am super excited about because I am in a ton of pain every single day. I am taking pain meds. I cannot survive without them. Um, having a catheter in you is extremely painful. And also when you're, when you have stitches down there and you're recovering from birth, and you have a catheter rubbing on that and irritating that, it is even more painful. But my heart like goes out to those who have to have catheters for even longer than I do, um, or if you have to live with a catheter for the rest of your life. I cannot imagine the pain I am in on an everyday basis is insane. And not only the pain, the physical pain, but the emotional and mental toll that it takes on you. Like, I have a leg bag now. I did have the big catheter where like you had to carry it, but they gave me a leg bag and I mean I can't wear my normal pants, I can't wear jeans, I can't wear leggings, I, I have to wear loose sweatpants. <laughs> um, I am still wearing an adult diaper with a pad in it and I mean I have a bag of urine on my leg, <laughs> like it's just so, it's terrible. Like I just feel like my body isn't even mine. Right now, I've been poked and prodded so much, and like with all these things going on, I just feel like a sh like I'm in a shell. I don't know, it's the weirdest thing to explain, but this recovery from this birth has been really, really hard. Um, physically, it's been really hard. I'm still having all the, these issues because I will not be getting my surgery until March 9th. So I'm just kind of dealing with all these issues right now. We're just kind of playing the waiting game. So physically I'm struggling a lot. Um, I'm not back to like, you know, myself. I can't just up and move around and do everything that I used to do. So that's been hard, but honestly, like the bulk of this recovery that has been a struggle has been my mental and emotional state like my hormones already are all over the place from you know giving birth but on top of that like the mental toll that all of this has taken on us is insane I I can't I don't know like I don't want to get out of bed I I don't want to put on makeup I don't want to do my hair I don't want to get out of the house and go to the store and on top of it you know, I feel like nobody really understands, unless they've been through something like this, how how draining it is on you, how draining it is on, I mean, your partner, Nate, like, he's been going through all this too, and I don't know, it just kills me because I feel like, I don't know. You're supposed to just like be grateful and be happy for what you have instead of being sad about what you've lost. And I feel like the biggest thing that so many people have been telling me is I'm like, oh, well, you know, you have two healthy babies and you're so lucky. And I am. I'm so lucky and I'm so blessed because I know some people struggle so hard to get pregnant or they have miscarriages or they can't have kids at all. And I'm not trying to sound like I'm not grateful for the two kids that I have because I am but to tell me that you should be grateful being grateful for having two babies doesn't take away the fact that you know my choice to have a third a fourth or whatever is taken from me like it doesn't make it better you know and it doesn't make it easier just because you have two babies that are healthy and happy doesn't mean that it's easier to cope with the fact that you can't have any more, you know? So, I don't know. It's just been really hard. Anyway, so I think I'm going to end it here. It's been, I feel like I've been ranting forever. Um, but I really want to keep filming my journey and my experience with all of this just to A, have it for myself, but B, I don't know, this process has been... Has been really lonely for me so I'm hoping that if I document it and get it out there maybe someone who's going through this as well or 
who's already gone through this or something similar can kind of relate and find some hope and some answers through my experience. Like I said, I'm going to try and continue to kind of document this journey, my surgery and my recovery and all that. Um, we have an appointment with a maternal fetal specialist next week um, to kind of talk about the risks and what the actual numbers are if we did want to try and get pregnant again in the future, which I'm pretty sure isn't going to happen just because I, I don't think I can take that risk when I have two kids at home that need me um, and it's terrifying to think about something happening to me. And then the week after that, I have my pre-op appointment where I get my catheter moved. And yeah, then the week after that, I'll have my surgery. So yeah, I don't know. It's been hard playing this waiting game, just kind of sitting here for seven weeks being like broken. I'm really excited to be on the road to recovery, even though I know like I'm terrified of surgery and I also know that physically and mentally and emotionally it's going to be really hard <laughs> to go through recovery but I'm also looking forward to recovering and being on the road to being better although I don't know if I'm ever going to be a hundred percent myself again um I just it's been really hard playing this waiting game just kind of sitting here and nothing's improving and we're just waiting. I, although I know that's what's best and that's what needs to happen, it's still really, really hard. Um, so yeah, they think that if they can do my surgery robotically that I should be having about a two to four week recovery um, if they can save my uterus. If they have to do the surgery robotically but I have to have a hysterectomy, it will probably be about a six week recovery. Um, and I know that's gonna be a lot harder. So yeah, and then again, if they have to go through my C-section scar, that will be about a six week recovery as well, regardless of the hysterectomy or not. So I'm really hoping that I can have this robotically and that they can save my uterus and that everything is fine. Um, if you guys believe in the power of prayer or good vibes or anything, please send them my way. I'm praying that they can save my uterus and that my bladder and everything will be okay. I'm praying that I don't have long lasting effects from this. I'm really sorry that this video was not the happy, positive birth story that I was hoping for. Um, but I'm really glad I got it out of the way. I have been avoiding this for a long time and I really just need to get it out. I felt like it wouldn't be right for me to just put up a vlog or put up something like normal after all this without discussing it and kind of putting it out there so yeah here it is my raw and real labor and delivery story and um i mean the one thing i really wanted to get out there is that if you are wanting to have more babies i would not recommend trying for a VBAC. um Although the risks of VBAC are essentially pretty low, 1 in 200 of uterine rupture, I was the 1 in 200 and it does happen and it's unfortunate that I was the one but it is real, it does happen and it's really scary and you can have a lot of long term effects from it so yeah I would just really try and think long and hard if um, it's worth it and if you're having if you want to have more babies I personally would go for a repeat c-section so yeah but that's about it I guess so all my uh, my love and hugs to you all and um, I will see you guys in my next video